We are thinking about vast abstractions, ideologies called communism, capitalism, uh, all these systems, and paying less and less attention to the world of physical reality, to the world of earth and trees and waters, people, and so are, in the name of all sorts of abstractions, busy destroying our natural environment. Not so long ago, the Congress voted a law imposing stern penalties upon anyone who should presume to burn the American flag. And they put this law through with a great deal of patriotic oratory and the quoting of poems and so on about old glory, uh, ignoring the fact entirely that these same congressmen, by acts of commission or omission, are burning up that for which the flag stands. They are allowing the utter pollution of our waters, of our atmosphere, the devastation of our forests, and uh, the increasing power of the bulldozer to bring about a ghastly fulfillment of the biblical prophecy that every valley shall be exalted, every mountain laid low, and the rough places plain. But you see, they don't see, they don't notice the difference between the flag and the country. Or as Kozhebsky pointed out, the difference between the map and the territory. Compare a physical globe and a political globe. The physical globe is a pretty thing with all kinds of green and brown wiggly uh, patterns on it. The political globe, on the other hand, uh, has still got the wiggly outlines of the land, but they are all crossed over with colored patches, many of which have completely straight edges. A lot of the boundary between the United States and Canada, once you get west of the Great Lakes, is simply a straight line. What has that got to do with anything? With any difference between Canadians on one side of the line or Americans on the other side of the line or, or what have you? Uh, it is absolutely a violation of the surface of the territory. And look at the fair city of San Francisco. It's a lovely place, but they planted on the hills of San Francisco a city pattern that was appropriate for the plains of Kansas, a gridiron. And so you get streets that go straight up and that are extremely dangerous, where they should have followed the contours of the hills. Now, however, I think we should begin by talking a little bit about when we use the word physical reality as distinct from abstraction, what are we talking about? Because you see, there's going to be a fight about this, philosophically. If I say that the, the final reality that we are living in is the physical world, a lot of people will say that I'm a materialist, that I'm unspiritual, and that uh, I think too much of an identification of the man with the body. You, any, any book that you open on yoga or uh, Hindu philosophy will have in it a uh, declaration that you start a meditation practice by saying to yourself, I am not the body. I am not my feelings. I am not my thoughts. I am the witness who watches all this and is not really any of it. And so if I were to say then that the physical world is the basic reality, I would seem to be contradicting what is said in these Hindu texts. But um, it all depends on what you mean by the physical world. What is it? First of all, it must be pointed out that the idea of the material world is itself philosophical. It is in its, uh, in its own way a symbol. And so if I take up something that uh, is generally agreed uh, to be something in the material world, and I argue that this is material, of course, it isn't, because nobody has ever been able to put their finger on anything material. That is to say, if you buy the word material, you mean some sort of basic stuff out of which the world is made. 
by, say, analogy with the art of ceramics, pottery. Uh, we use clay and we form it into various shapes. And so a lot of people think that the physical world is various forms of matter. And nobody has ever been able to discover any matter. They've been able to discover various forms, yes, various patterns, but no, no matter. You can't even think what, you, how you would describe matter in some terms other than form. Because whenever a physicist talks about the nature of the world, he, he describes a, a form, he describes a process which can be put into the shape of a mathematical equation. And so if you say A plus B equals B plus A, everybody knows exactly what you mean. It's a perfectly clear statement. But nobody needs to ask, what do you mean by A or what do you mean by B? Or if you say 1 plus 2 equals 3, that's perfectly clear. But you don't need to know 1 what, 2 what, or 3 what. And all our descriptions of the physical world have the nature of these formulae, numbers. They are simply mathematical patterns. Because what we're talking about is pattern. But it's pattern of such a high degree of complexity that it's very difficult to deal with it by thinking. In science, uh, we really work in two different ends of the spectrum of reality. We can deal with problems in which there are very few variables. Or we can deal with problems in which there are almost infinitely many variables. But in between, we're pretty helpless. In other words, the average person cannot think through a problem involving more than three variables without a pencil in his hand. That's why, for example, it's difficult uh, to learn complex music. Think uh, of an organist who has two keyboards or three keyboards for work with his hands, and each hand is doing a different rhythm. And then his feet on the pedals. He could be doing a different rhythm with each foot. Now that's a different, difficult thing for people to learn to do, just like to rub your stomach in a circle and pat your head at the same time takes a, a, a little skill. Now, uh, most problems with which we deal in everyday life involve far more than three variables. And uh, we are really incapable of thinking about them. Actually, the way we think about most of our problems is simply going through the motions of thinking. We don't really think about them. We do most of our decision-making by hunch. You can collect data about a decision that you have to make, but the data that you collect has the same sort of relation to the actual processes involved in this decision as a uh, skeleton to a living body. It's just the bones. And there are all sorts of entirely unpredictable possibilities involved in every decision. And uh, you, you don't really think about it at all. The truth of the matter is that um, we are as successful as we are, which is surprising. Uh, the degree to which we are successful in conducting our everyday practical lives because our brains do the thinking for us in an entirely unconscious way. The brain uh, is far more complex than any computer. The brain is in fact the most complex known object in the universe because our neurologists don't understand it. They have a very primitive conception of the brain and admit it. And therefore, if we do not understand our own brains, that simply shows that our brains are a great deal more intelligent than we are. Uh, meaning by we, the thing that we have identified ourselves with. Instead of being sensible and identifying ourselves with our brains, we identify ourselves with a very small operation of the brain which is the faculty of conscious attention, which is a sort of radar that we have that scans the environment for unusual features. 
and we think we are that, and we are nothing of the kind. That's just a little, uh, little trick we do. So, actually, we, our brain is analyzing all sensory input all the time. Analyzing all the things you don't notice, don't think about, don't have even names for. And so it is this marvelous complex goings on which is responsible for our being able to adapt ourselves intelligently to the rest of the physical world. The brain is furthermore an operation of the physical world. But now you see, though, we get back to this question. Physical world. This is a concept. This is simply an idea. And uh, if you want to ask me to differentiate between the physical and the spiritual, I will not put the spiritual in the same class as the abstract. But most people do. They think that one plus two equals three is a proposition of a more spiritual nature than, say, for, for example, a tomato. <laughs> but I think a tomato is a lot more spiritual than one plus two equals three. <laughs> This is where we really get to the point. That's why in Zen Buddhism, when people ask what is the fundamental principle of Buddhism, you could very well answer a tomato. <laughs> because uh, look how, when you examine the material world, how diaphanous it is. It really isn't very solid. A tomato doesn't last very long. Nor, for that matter, do the things that we consider most uh, exemplary of physical reality, such as mountains. The poet says, the hills are shadows, and they flow from form to form, and nothing stands. Because the physical world is diaphanous. It's like music. Uh, when you play music, it simply disappears. There's nothing left. And that, for that very reason, it is one of the highest and most spiritual of the arts because it is the most transient. And so, in a way, you might say that transiency is a mark of spirituality. A lot of people think the opposite, that the spiritual things are the everlasting things. But you see, the more a thing tends to be permanent, the more it tends to be lifeless. So then, uh, the, the physical world, we can't even find any stuff out of which it's made. We can only recognize each other. And I say, well, I r realize that I met you before and that I see you again. But the thing that I recognize is not um, anything really except a consistent pattern. Let's suppose I have a rope and this rope begins by being manila rope, then it goes on by being cotton rope, then it goes on with being nylon, then it goes on with being silk. So I tie a knot in the rope, and I move the knot down along the rope. Now is it as it moves along the same knot or a different knot? We would say it was the same because you recognize the pattern of the knot. But at one point it's manila, at another point it's cotton, at another point it's nylon, and at another it's silk. And that's just like us. We are recognized by the fact that one day you face the same way as you did the day before. And people recognize your facing. So they say that's John Doe or Mary Smith. But actually the contents of your face uh, whatever they may be, the water, the carbons, the chemicals, are changing all the time. You're like a whirlpool in a stream. The stream is doing this consistent whirlpooling, and we always recognize, like at the uh, Niagara, the, the whirlpool is one of the sites. But the water is always moving on. And this is why it's so spiritual. To be non-spiritual is not to see that, in other words. It is to impose upon the physical world the idea of thingness, of substantiality. That is to be involved in matter. 
to identify with the body. To believe, in other words, that the body is something constant, something tangible. So therefore, if you cling to the body, you will be frustrated. So the whole point is that the material world, the world of nature, is marvelous, so long as you don't try to lean on it. And if you don't cling to it, you can have a wonderful time with it. Let's take a very controversial issue. All spiritual people are generally against lovemaking. In my point of view, yes, women can be a source of evil if you attempt to possess them. I mean, if you can say of another person, I love you so much I want to own you, and really tie you down, and uh, call you, well, it's like that poem of Ogden Nash, where someone <laughs> claimed that he loved his wife so much that he climbed a mountain and named it after her. Called it Mount Mrs. Oswald Tregenis. <laughs> <laughs> And so, in other words, if you try to possess people and you make your sexual passion possessive in that way, then, of course, you are trying to cling to the physical world. But you see, women are, in a way, much more interesting if you don't cling to them, if you let them be themselves and be free. And uh, in, in my opinion, you can have a very spiritual sex life if you are not possessive. But if, on the other hand, you are possessive, then you're in trouble. But, you know, the average Swami won't uh, agree with that because he confuses... He, by thinking that the body, the body that I touch, is something evil. He's hung up with it. It's like the story of the two Zen monks who were crossing a river. And uh, it was uh, the ford was very deep because of the flood. And there was a girl trying to get across. And one of the monks immediately picked her up, threw her over his shoulder and carried her across, put her down on the other side. And then they, the monks went one way and she went another. And uh, the other monk had been in a kind of embarrassed silence, and which he finally broke. And he said, do you realize that you broke a monastic rule by touching and picking up a woman like that? And he said, oh, but I left her on the other side of the river and you're still carrying her. <laughs> so the whole question then, you see, is that uh, the, the, even you can find this to some extent in some uh, rather irritable saint, Paul, uh, where he speaks of the opposition of the flesh and the spirit. Now, this word, sox, in Greek, the flesh, as he uses it, is, is, a, is really, as Bajayev points out, it's a spiritual category. In, for, for the Christian, you see, the word is made flesh in Christ and uh, there will be the resurrection of the body in the final consummation of the universe. So you cannot really, in, uh, as an orthodox Christian, take an uh, antagonistic attitude to the flesh. Why then does St. Paul take an antagonistic attitude to the flesh? Well, you can only save the situation and make the New Testament consistent with itself by saying that he meant by the flesh a, a certain kind of spiritual category. He didn't mean this, because this isn't flesh. Flesh is a concept. This is not. And so the flesh, or you might say, we talk about the sins of the flesh, they have entirely to do with certain hang-ups that we have about our, our bodies. And that, again, is what I would call leaning on the world, exploiting it. When you take, as a Buddhist, you take the third precept, kame sumi chachara vermani sikapadam samandiyami. And it's usually translated, I undertake the precept to refrain from adultery. It doesn't say anything of the kind. 
Kama is passion. Kama Sumitjahara, therefore, is I undertake the precept not to exploit the passions. So, in other words, uh, you, you, you may be bored, see? And you're feeling sort of empty and at a loose end, and you think, well, um, I don't know, let's go and commit adultery. It might liven things up, see? <laughs> Uh, and, and that would be ex uh, what they call in Zen, raising waves when no wind is blowing. <laughs> it would be quite a different matter if uh, in a perfectly spontaneous and natural way uh, you uh, fell in love with some woman. Uh, you, you wouldn't be going out of your way to get into trouble. It would be appropriate and natural at the time. Or in the same way, a lot of people, uh, instead of saying, let's commit adultery, when they feel sort of bored, they say, let's go and eat something. And so they become fatter and fatter and fatter because they're filling the spiritual vacuum in their psyche with food, which doesn't do the job. It uh, is not the function of food to fill spiritual vacuums. So uh, in, in this way, one exploits the appetites or the passions. Uh, so likewise, also, the, the fifth precept, Sura Meriya Majapamadatana, uh, is the list of intoxicating substances. And uh, it doesn't say that you are not going to take them. It says you're not going to be intoxicated by them. In other words, a Buddhist may drink but not get drunk. I don't know how that applies to psychedelics, but that's another story. So, one might say then that we are confused through and through about what we mean by the material world. And what I'm first of all doing is I'm just giving a number of illustrations which show how confused we are. And let me repeat this to get it clear because it is rather complicated. In the first place, we confuse uh, abstract symbols, that is to say, numbers and words and formulae, with physical events, as we confuse money with consumable wealth. In the second place, we confuse physical events, the whole class and category of physical events, with matter. But matter, you see, is an idea, it's a concept. It's the concept of stuff, of something solid and permanent that you can catch hold of. Now, you just can't catch hold of the physical world. The physical world is the uh, most evasive, elusive uh, process that there is. It will not be pinned down, and therefore it fulfills all the requirements of spirit. So what I'm saying then is that the, 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 the non-abstract world, which Kozhebsky called unspeakable, which was really a rather good word, um, <laughs> is the spiritual world. And the spiritual world isn't something kind of gaseous, abstract, formless, in that sense of shapeless. It's formless in another sense. The formless world is the wiggly world. See, it's, when we say something is shapeless, like a cloud, what shape has this cloud? You say, well, it's so vague, it's, it's, it's shapeless. That's the real formless world. The formal world is the one that human beings try to construct all the time. See, wherever human beings have been around, you see rectangles and straight lines. Because we're always trying to straighten things out. And so that's the, the, the very mark of our presence. I don't know why we do it. It's always been a puzzle to me why architects are always using rectangles. But the thing is that they make us feel very uncomfortable if they don't. I have an architect friend who built somebody a house like a, um, a snail shell. And it, was a, it spiraled in and in and in and in, and the John was right at the center. <laughs> <laughs> it was a spiral. 
But everybody rebels against this house. They just feel very uncomfortable. You see, the furniture doesn't fit. Because all furniture is made to fit in a rectilinear seam. And uh, we, we're always putting things in boxes. See, all thoughts, all words are labels on boxes. Therefore, we feel we've got to get everything boxed. And so we put ourselves in boxes. Everything is put in boxes. But actually, everything else in nature doesn't go that way. As, for example, the snail doesn't put itself in a box. The crab doesn't put itself in a box. It has these fascinating, gorgeous objects. What is, for example, more beautiful than a conch shell or a lovely scallop shell? Well, these are gorgeous things. We could make the most delicious shells out of concrete or plastics. Uh, they, they could be very beautiful. And we could distribute ourselves over the landscape like shellfish along the seashore. But instead, we have to live in boxes. And there's nothing. You can't fight it. It's the system. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, then you have to, you, you, you begin to build your furniture and chairs, everything accordingly to these shapes because they are easy to store away in a place that is a box in the first place. But you see, then that is this rectilineal world. This is unspiritual. This is the world of uh, what we will call the artificial as distinct from the natural. And uh, when we live in a world like that, we begin to have ourselves bamboozled by it. You think, you begin to think that reality is this sort of straightened out situation that we all have to live in. And uh, you don't remember that reality is precisely the wiggly world, you see? we don't realize that we are all wiggly. The problem is that we wiggle in rather the same way. We have head, two arms, two legs, etc. Uh, but notice how we do all sorts of things to ourselves to sort of evade our wiggliness. The way we dress, especially men, Women are allowed to be a little bit more curvaceous and wiggly than men are. It's somewhat appreciated. But men go around in these square-cut suits and straight pants. They're really... Uh, these uh, clothes that we wear in the West are originally military uniforms. Do you know that? That's why they have buttons on the sleeve. Because you used to have buttons all the way up the sleeves so that people wouldn't wipe their noses on their sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were livery, in other words. And uh, this uniform is being adopted all over the world. I was in Ceylon in November. And uh, the moment I got to Ceylon, I saw the men were going around in sarongs with uh, long white shirts over them. So I bought such an outfit. Uh, it was terribly hot. And therefore, this kind of clothing was extremely comfortable. And they wear a sort of a stole, usually yellow or orange, which is a, a little scarf with fringe around your neck. And it's the most uh, easy, wonderful garment for loafing around in. Well, I was invited to speak at the University of Ceylon, Kandy, and. Uh, I found when I got there, I found that it was a very tense atmosphere because there was a great degree of anti-American feeling because we cut off aid and they don't approve of our behavior in Vietnam and all that kind of thing. So I was an American speaker and a, when I appeared, they started booing. But I was wearing Sinhalese clothes and I got up and said, uh, I had an interpreter who was a very a bright psychology graduate student. And I got up and said, um, ladies and gentlemen, and the gentlemen, incidentally, were all wearing white shirts and pants. <laughs> and I got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, I have purposely put on tonight your national dress. 
For the first reason, it is practical. You have developed this over many hundreds of years as the right kind of clothes to wear in this climate, and I find it uh, very suitable. The second is, it is properly adapted to male anatomy. And there's a big laugh at this. And the interpreter whispered to me, he said, you meant it that way, didn't you? <laughs> I said, yes. But you know, that broke the ice. And there was no further trouble. <laughs> But you see, uh, th th there's a curious paradox about this, that that kind of clothing follows the wiggliness of things and doesn't contradict it. But what is the paradoxical about it is that both these Sinhalese clothes and Japanese clothes and um, Indonesian clothes don't attempt to violate the nature of cloth. And they are more rectangular than our clothes. But they don't look that way when you put them on. You can take a kimono and fold it and pack it away. And when you unpack, you don't have to have it pressed. A, uh, the, the, the Sinhalese Minister of Education's wife was talking to us about saris. She said, I've got these saris, I can pack 20 saris into a small suitcase. And when I travel, I can wear three a day. But there's, there's nothing but an enormous piece of, of woven material, rectilinear. But they feel, you see, that since it is the nature of cloth to be woven this way and to be rectilinear, you shouldn't violate the nature of cloth when you make clothes. And so we, with all these fitted clothes that we have, with this extraordinary shoulder work and uh, so on, uh, they're impossible to pack. Every time you take, travel with a business suit, you have to get it pressed if you want to look decent. And that's true of many women's clothes, too. But by following the nature of cloth and not violating it, the cloth then will follow the nature of your body. And it will gracefully adapt to it and hang in just the right way. And uh, you, by, by, as it were, respecting the physical world. In either case, it all goes together. But this world, this physical world, is wiggly. And uh, this is the most important thing to realize about it. As I've sometimes said, we're living in the middle of a Rorschach plot. And uh, there really is no way that the physical world is. In other words, the, the nature of truth, I said in the beginning, somebody had said that thoughts were made to conceal truth. This is, this is the fact, because there is no such thing as the truth that can be stated. In other words, ask the question, what is the true position of the stars in the Big Dipper? Well, it depends where you're looking at them from. And there is no absolute position. So, in the same way, uh, accountants, a good accountant will tell you that any balance sheet is simply a matter of opinion. Uh, there's no such thing as the true state of affairs of a, of a business. But we're all hooked on the idea that there is, you see, an external objective world, which is a certain way. And that there, it really is that way. History, for example, is a matter of opinion. Uh, history is an art, not a science. It's something constructed, which is accepted as a more or less satisfactory explanation of events, which, as a matter of fact, don't have an explanation at all. Most of what happens in history is completely irrational. But people always have to feel that they've got to find a meaning. For example, you get sick, and uh, you've lived a very good life, and uh, you've been helpful to other people and done all sorts of nice things. And you get cancer. And you say to the, part, to the clergyman, why did this have to happen to me? And you're looking for an explanation, and there isn't one. It just happened that way. But people feel if they can't find an explanation, uh, they feel very, very insecure. Why? Because they haven't been able to straighten things out. <laughs> the world is not that way. So the truth, in other words, what is going on, 
is, of course, a lot of wiggles. But uh, the way it is is always in relation to the way you are. In other words, however hard I hit a skinless drum, it will make no noise. Because noise is a relationship between a fist and a skin. So in exactly the same way, light is a relationship between electrical energy and eyeballs. It is you, in other words, who evoke the world, and you evoke the world in accordance with what kind of a you you are, what kind of an organism. One organism evokes one world, another organism evokes another world. And so everything, reality, is, is, is a kind of relationship. So once one gets rid of the idea of the truth as some way the world is in a fixed sense, say, it is that way, see? Then you get to another idea of the truth altogether. The idea of the truth that cannot be stated, the truth that cannot be pinned down. I might say that I'm interested in Japanese materialism because, contrary to popular belief, Americans are not materialists. We are not people who love material. But our culture is, by and large, devoted to the transformation of material into junk as rapidly as possible. God's own junkyard. And therefore, it's a very, very important lesson for a wealthy nation and for rich people. And we are all colossally rich by the standards of the rest of the world. It's very important for such people to learn and see what happens to material in the hands of people who love it. We regard matter as something that gets in our way, something whose limitations are to be abolished as fast as possible. And therefore, we have bulldozers and every kind of technical device for knocking it out of the way. And we like to do as much obliteration of time and space as possible. We talk about killing time and getting there as fast as possible. So if you can take a jet plane from one city to another, and everybody's doing it, not just a privileged few, then they're going to be the same town. So to preserve the whole world from indefinite Los Angelization, uh, <laughs> pardon me, those of you who are from Southern California. <laughs> but uh, we have to learn in the United States how to enjoy material and to be true materialists instead of exploiters of material. Well now, basic to all this is the philosophy of nature. And the Japanese philosophy of nature is probably founded historically in the Chinese philosophy of nature. And that's what I want to go into to start with. To let the cat out of the bag, right at the beginning, the assumptions underlying Far Eastern culture, and this is true as far west as India also, is that the whole cosmos, the whole universe, is one being. The great men of this culture, not everybody, but the great men, the great masters of whatever sphere they're in, are fundamentally of this feeling that what you are is the thing that always was, is and will be. Only it's playing the game called Mr. Takano or Mr. Lee <laughs> or Mr. Mukhopadhyaya. <laughs> That's a special game it's playing. Just like there's the fish game, the grass game, the bamboo game, the pine tree game. They're all ways of going. You see, everything's doing a dance. Only it's doing it according to the nature of the dance. That is fundamentally all these dances for the human, fish, bird, cloud, sky dance, star dance, etc. They're all one fundamental dance. And so a, a civilized, cultured, above all an enlightened person, in this culture is one who knows that 
his so-called separate personality, his ego, is an illusion. Illusion doesn't mean a bad thing. It just means a play. From the Latin word uh, ludere, we get English illusion. Ludere means to play. And so the Sanskrit word maya, meaning illusion, also means magic, skill, art, and this Sanskrit conception comes through China to Japan with the transmission of Buddhism.